Welcome back, everyone. Um, so in this lecture, what we're going to do is look at some reactions um, that kind of couple together multiple different reactions that we've seen in the past and use them to build a lot of complexity in a molecule in very few steps. Before we go on into the actual reactions, I thought it'd be worth spending just a little bit of time thinking about why it's important to make these complicated molecules. Uh, so the molecule here that I'm showing is called norethisterone. Um, it's very, very useful uh, in menopause therapy. Um, and if you're looking at this molecule, it looks very, very complicated. There's a lot of things going on, but one thing you might notice is that there's a conjugated ketone in there, much like the conjugated ketones we make in aldol reactions. The reason that norethisterone actually works really well is because it looks very similar to the molecule estrogen, which is obviously an important hormone. Um, and you can kind of see the similarities. Um, the same kind of four fused rings together. Um, a difference now is there's an aromatic ring here rather than the non-aromatic ring at the start, but the oxygen in the phenol of estrogen is there. And then finally, another thing you might notice is this alkyne up here at the top. Uh, it turns out that alkyne is really important. Uh, what people found doing a lot of studies is that the body is very good at breaking down things like estrogen, but if you put an alkyne here, the body doesn't know what to do with it. And that allows the uh, norethisterone to stick around longer in the body and to be effective. And so one of the important reactions for building these types of molecules is the Robinson annulation, uh, where annulation means ring construction. And so this is actually the original Robinson annulation that Robinson reported in 1935. And the reaction that he did was to take cyclohexanone, first make a sodium enolate, so reacting with sodium amide, um, then adding an electrophile, so what looks like a Michael acceptor here, a conjugated ketone, and then lastly to do an acidic workup. And it turns out if you do all those things, you end up creating a new ring that's fused to the original molecule. Um, it's going to look a little bit different, um, but to try to help you out and understand what's going on here, I'm going to do some labeling. So the carbon of the carbonyl, cyclohexanone, is ending up here, and that's reacting with the nucleophilic side of the reaction partner. And then the more nucleophilic side of the enol or enolate is the blue atom here reacting with the gray electrophilic um, alkene there. And so what I just said really fast was that there's actually two different reactions going on here, both of which we've already seen. This top half here is a conjugated carbonyl, which is formed from an aldol reaction. And this bottom part there is actually coming from the Michael addition. There's no carbonyl there. Um, and we've lost this pi bond. So a 1,4 addition or Michael addition that we just saw. And so this is actually a really cool reaction. Um, it all happens in one flask. Um, you take your cyclohexanone, uh, add in sodium amide, make sure that that stirs long enough to get you an enolate. Once you're happy and you've formed all of your enolate, you can then go ahead and add in the electrophile. And that electrophile is first going to do a Michael addition to construct kind of the lower half of the molecule. And then as the reaction progresses, it'll then do the aldol reaction. And then during the acid workup, you'll do the elimination to make sure the condensation takes place. Okay, so now let's work through this mechanism. Um, again, it follows these three reactions, enolate formation, Michael addition, aldol reaction. Um, and so starting with the cyclohexanone, this is gonna react with sodium amide to make the enolate. And now there's a sodium enolate instead of a lithium one. Um, this enolate is gonna be the nucleophile that's gonna react with our Michael acceptor. And so in this case, um, it's helpful to number a little bit just to keep track, but looks like we will be reacting from nucleophilic carbon down here, electrophilic carbon over here. It's our Michael addition. Um, we can go ahead and draw our nucleophile out the same way and put in a new bond, and then I can kind of cheat and rotate around just to make it easier for me to uh, draw things in. And so the big thing to kind of remember is that now we are making an enolate. After every initial Michael addition, we end up making a new enolate. And this enolate is going to be in equilibrium with a bunch of other enolates, but the one that we really care about is the enolate um, that gets us to the correct product. Um, and so that's going to be the enolate out here. 
So I will go ahead and draw that. And if I number through um, and look at my electrophile versus my nucleophile, um, I'll see that this is the way that's best for getting us to a six-membered ring with no bridges in it. And so that should be the most stable ring that forms. And so there is our aldol addition step. And so it's easiest to kind of draw all of this while trying to get us to two six-membered rings here, uh, where the new bond is being formed in red, as indicated. At this stage, the reaction will be stuck until acidic workup, and once there's an acidic workup, then that E1 elimination can take place, and then we get to uh, the final conjugated carbonyl um, compound with now a new ring constructed. So I feel like that's a pretty cool reaction. You're doing all of these different things, um, essentially all at once, and this is starting to approach the level of what biology does. And so you can imagine that biology also needs a way to build these rings, but it is doing it all essentially in one big cascade of reactions. And the Robinson annulation is a step in that direction from the synthetic chemist. So let's look at a couple of examples of the Robinson annulation. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is a two-step process where they've broken up the Michael and the aldol from each other. And the reason that that happens is because instead of a regular carbonyl compound, they're starting with a siloenol ether. And so if you think back to all the other siloenol ethers you've seen, those are a little bit less nucleophilic, a little, little bit less reactive. And so because of that, they can be, undergo more controlled reactions, less steps overall. Um, the electrophile here is a very common one that's used in Robinson annulations called methyl vinyl ketone, or MVK, by synthetic organic chemists. And then this reagent down here, um, trifluoroboron, is a good Lewis acid, which we typically need uh, when reacting with siloenol ethers. And so this reaction is done cold to make sure it only does the Michael addition. And so if we're building out our product, then we can take our initial nucleophilic siloenol ether, get rid of the siloenol ether, and then plug in our new bond and then the rest of um, the electrophile. And so the researchers who did this reaction um, then did a second step to finish off the Robinson annulation. Um, so I'm going to redraw uh, the product of the initial Michael addition down here. And for the second aldol addition step and then finally condensation what they used was sodium methoxide and methanol and so then what you're kind of looking for um, are the potential enol or enolite sites and then potential electrophilic sites um, and then doing it this way gets you to a non-bridged but fused ring system whereas if you were to take for example this carbon as your nucleophile and this carbonyl is your electrophile, you would make a bridged ring, and that's a little bit more difficult. And so I've kind of laid out the product here, getting us the new pi bond between 1 and 6. Here's another example. And so this one is kind of an interesting example as well, just a little bit more complicated because it has another ring attached uh, to the original carbonyl. And so if you take these two reactants, react them again under these sodium methoxide conditions, so these kind of uh, equilibrating enolate generation conditions, um, it should be possible for us to really figure out what the product looks like. So the first pair you have to find is the nucleophile electrophile in the Michael addition. And then you want to find the nucleophile electrophile in the aldol reaction. And so I'm going to keep drawing this out here, but one thing you'll notice right away is that uh, the two reactions are kind of swapped. The initial nucleophile for Michael addition uh, belongs to a carbonyl that is the electrophile for the aldol reaction. And so if you're looking at the product and how all of that lines up, um, you, you'll see all of those atoms kind of right next to each other. So the electrophile to Michael addition, the nucleophile to the Michael addition, the electrophile to the aldol reaction, the nucleophile in the aldol reaction. And so it's definitely difficult, but not impossible, to just look at these two reactants, recognize there might be a Robinson annulation, um, and draw out this product. Uh, but for most people, it would make much more sense to kind of take the two-step route um, that we were forced to do up here, 
uh, first draw out the product of the Michael addition, then work on the aldol side. So here's a different reaction. Uh, this one is called the Darzins reaction. Um, it's going to look kind of like an aldol reaction at first, but the product will be a little bit different. Um, so for example, if I take um, acetone and react it with this alpha chloroester uh, in the presence of sodium methoxide, what I end up getting is actually a molecule that has an epoxide in it rather than the aldol condensation product. Um, and so you can ask yourselves right away, well, why is this happening? And so naturally, we'll look at the mechanism for it. Um, if you're looking at the product, you see that the ester remains intact. And so that tells us that the ester in the reactants is the nucleophile, while the acetone is the electrophile. And so we'll want to start off making the enolate of the ester. This kind of makes sense because the chlorine should make the hydrogens here a little bit more acidic. So that enolate should be a little bit easier to form. And so we should expect to have the kind of chloroenolate there. Um, that enolate should then do a nucleophilic attack onto acetone, kind of a normal carbonyl addition. And if we kind of go through and draw in our nucleophilic and electrophilic atoms, then we can figure out what our initial product looks like. And so I will do that right here and fill in all of the parts. And the key thing to see is that we have now a nucleophilic oxygen next to an electrophilic carbon, um, and this carbon is electrophilic because it still has a leaving group attached to it. And so this means that an SN2 reaction can happen. That SN2 reaction does happen, and that's how we get to an epoxide in the end. Um, and so this is kind of a clever reaction because it couples the carbonyl chemistry of this unit with the SN2 reactions of last unit. Um, and you can kind of imagine that there's all sorts of different ways to construct your molecule so that there might be something else that can happen at this stage rather than the expected aldol condensation or Robinson annulation. Cool. So that takes us through our coverage of carbonyl chemistry. And so this was the big second unit of carbonyl chemistry where we really focused on chemistry that happens using the enols and enolates as nucleophiles um, and usually carbonyls as electrophiles. So from here, I think the most effective thing for us to do is to really look at lots of practice problems, um, get a lot of practice with predicting products, um, given a complicated looking reaction, deriving a mechanism, or at least understanding how the product was formed, um, and things like that. So um, definitely take a look at all the practice problems. Um, for any of the reactions I didn't give you a mechanism during lecture for, um, I think it's worth going back and studying and make sure those reaction mechanisms are understood.